All right, Alexander, let's answer all the questions from the live stream we did with I Earl Grey channel. And let's get started with, uh, let's see, Budweiser, thank you for that super sticker. Michael Yurik, thank you for that super sticker. Serge, thank you for that super sticker. And Roland says, the cabinet secretary is in control. Yes, prime minister. Hashtag yes. <laughs> once, a, once upon a time... Uh, possibly, you know, in the old days, the cabinet secretary was a powerful official. We even had a comedy program in Britain in the early 1980s called Yes Minister, in which it was made to seem as if the cabinet secretary was the person who really ran everything and uh, appointed the ministers and did, did you know, control the whole thing. We're long past that point today. I mean... I, I think cabinet secretaries today, if not exactly inconsequential officials, they're certainly not the power that they once were. And I'm afraid, I don't think anybody is. I don't think anybody in the political system is as powerful. You, can, you can't say that there is a single decision maker anymore. And I'm afraid also that an awful lot of decisions are made outside the governmental structures in ways that make it very difficult to tell exactly who's making which decision at any particular point in time. All right, Mitt P says, Spain, Portugal, Greece does not agree with the EU proposal for 15% cut to gas use. Many more to disagree in the coming days and months. Absolutely. I think we're going to see a massive row over this over the next few weeks and months. And of course, if things get worse, there'll be even more of a row. I mean, what this is all about is trying to protect Germany, or to be more precise, trying to protect Robert Habeck. So uh, that, that, that's ultimately what this idea of, you know, um, EU imposing controls on um, energy use right across Europe. Why would Spain, for example, which apparently is, you know, in a better energy position than, say, Germany is, want to come to Germany's res rescue because Robert Habeck made a kind of a, a series of decisions which were disastrous for Germany. So, you know, I, I think we're going to see a lot more argument and quarrelling here. But, you know, the EU has enormous levers of control and, of course, it will start to use them. Yeah. Um, Hank, thank you for that super sticker. Danitza says, uh, collective problem... In collective West, no one is happy with their governments, but there's no alternative. Yes, I, you put your finger on it. I think that is exactly right. Yeah. From Valias, thank you for that super chat. From William, what about England's deep state revealed by Boris Johnson? Indeed, absolutely. I mean, it was a major uh, a major statement that Boris made in the House of Commons. And by the way, I'm starting now to see the reaction. There's already been attacks on Johnson by people like David Aranovich in the London Times for daring to use those words. So um, I, I, I think that, as I said previously, the deep state, which does most certainly exist in Britain, will neither forgive nor forget Johnson for uttering those words. And Whatever he might have expected or hoped, I think that they're now definitely going to do everything they possibly can to marginalise him and to remove him from the political scene. RDDR says, is the West declining due to decadence? I think it's declining for a large number of reasons. And the decadence is perhaps more a symptom of the decline than its cause but, of course, a symptom can also, after a certain point, become a cause. So when a person dies because they become ill and they have a very, very high fever, the fever may be caused by the illness, but, of course, it may be the fever that kills you. All right. Um, Sanjeva says, Putin visiting Iran and the MOU for a pipeline. Anybody who remembered... Persia-Russian relations would have found it inconceivable a couple of decades ago. Geopolitics have changed dramatically. Absolutely correct. That is so true. I mean, I, I mean, I, even in the the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, 
you know, the, the first, the revolutionary leader, the man who overthrew the Shah. Our relations between Russia and Iran were very, very prickly. And Iran, historically, has not had good relations with Russia. I mean, they've fought many wars, which, by the way, the Russians tended to win. But it's never been an easy relationship. And, of course, the Soviet Union occupied much of Iran during the Second World War. And that left a, a lot of ill feeling towards Russia in Iran. And yet now that all seems to have um, been put aside. From Radio Constantinopolis says, what will, what will time-wise be the window from do for dollar collapse to the new state of affairs? I don't know. I don't think anybody does. I mean, I'm not going to say when I think dollar collapse will come because I'm not, going to, I'm not in a position to give a timeline for that. And I think if it does come, how things will play out is um, so complicated and so difficult to, uh, um, to, to guess or, or work out that I don't think anybody could really predict with any confidence, any degree of confidence, exactly how events would shape. All I would say is that um, it's more likely to be very chaotic than orderly. From Martin Jax, I must be a Duran junkie. If I do not get my daily doses of Christopher Mercurius, I get to the geopolitical shakes. Thank you, Martin, for that. Uh, RDDR says, uh, is she returning the CPC to Marxism? I don't think the CCP has ever actually parted with Marxism. I think this is a misunderstanding. I think they've done a lot of things which went against the Soviet copybook, if you like. But the more I've actually been reading Chinese things, the more I've been reading about the kind of literature the CCP uh, produces, the more I think I realise that these people remain very, very much Marxists. From uh, David S., thank you for that super sticker. From Yov, uh, call her least trust, please. <laughs> I'm um, sure Michael, that Michael that, Sherry I, says you yeah. might have coined you might have coined an expression there. I wouldn't be surprised if now others start adopting it and it becomes universal. Uh, Michael Sherry says Sir Keir has a lot of questions to answer regarding the Ford report: stealing lies and racist from the right wing Labour Party. Absolutely, I completely agree. Now, can I just explain about the Ford report? So. Um, Shortly after Corbyn resigned as leader, um, a report was leaked by uh, some dissident Corbyn Corbynists within the Labour Party, which uh, this report was carried out to look at how the Labour Party dealt with the anti-Semitism issue. And um, it detailed, this report detailed what appeared to have been a massive campaign of sabotage of Corbyn's leadership from within Labour Party headquarters. Now, um, Starmer basically didn't accept that report, and he commissioned another report by uh, uh, um, a British lawyer called Ford to basically review the whole topic all over again. And this report, which Ford has now published, it seems to me has come to essentially the same conclusions as the leaked report. It's tried to be a bit more measured in its language, but it also says that there was a campaign within Labour Party HQ basically to undermine Corbyn. And rather uh, astonishingly, it talks about a hierarchy of racism within the uh, Labour Party so that, you know, it wasn't acceptable to attack one ethnic group, but it was perfectly acceptable to say, to say uh, uh, crude and stereotypical and ugly things about members of other ethnic groups, all as part of an internal factional battle within the Labour Party. So I think that's what, ha what has happened. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible picture of what the Labour Party is like, of how the, the Labour Party functions. It's not received a huge amount of publicity in Britain, but it does make you doubt that the Labour Party is really fit for uh, government in Britain. 
and it makes me feel even more that the British Labour Party is very, very much like the American Democratic Party. In other words, that they share many of the same faults and problems and vices, uh, um, you know, across the pond, as we say in Britain, you know, on, on one side of the Atlantic and on the other. From uh, Jincha. Jin, Jin Several Ukrainian radio stations broadcast that Zelensky is in intensive care. His duties performed by the Speaker of the Rada, Ruslan Stefanchuk. I would like to see much more confirmation of these stories. There's also been rumours which are uh, um, apparently, you know, from fairly reliable sources that there was an assassination attempt on him. But, you know, <laughs> this is all rumour at the moment. It's not provable fact. So let's not run away with assumptions. Remember all the stories about Putin, you know, suffering from cancer and Parkinson's disease and all of these things. And the head of the CIA has now come along and told us that these, these, none of those stories was true. Now, I knew those stories weren't true. I don't know the same about Zelensky. But I'm not going to assume that these stories are true until I know a little bit more about them. All right. From uh, RDDR, is Putin a Bonapartist? No. Absolutely not. I don't think so. I mean, I think Bonaparte was a, um, I mean, in some ways a very brilliant man, but um, I mean, he was clearly a dictator within France. I mean, he was, he made himself emperor and he ruled France in a very, very authoritarian way. And uh, of course, he was also a person who was involved in many, many wars. I don't think Putin is anything like him in that respect. There are some things they have in common. But I don't think, in the end, they're like each other. All right. uh, Zuk Zuxi says, afternoon, gentlemen, in chat. Jincha says, mm. the message sent out on Ukrainian radio stations about Alensky in intensive care was done by hackers. Wow, the world. There, you go. there, there we you go. go. Uh, Radio Konstantinopolis says, I have a hunch that Russia has been really preparing for this since before the fall of the Berlin Wall. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt that it goes back that far, if I may say. I mean, if you look at um, the Russia of the 1990s, which I visited, I mean, they weren't remotely in position to prepare anything like this then. From uh, Claudia, civil servants are fighting Brexit. Oh, yeah. All the time. Um, always have been. I mean, they hated Brexit. And um, they oppose Brexit and they'd love to find some way of reversing it. And they're still, they're still there and they're still doing the same things. No question about that. From uh, Stick Marks, thanks, thanks for glad for your walk and talks are back. It's pretty much all clown news at the moment, but things can get worse. A few more cocos to perform. Absolutely true. Yeah. Matthew Jones says, Wait, watched three Harmars go down the highway headed towards Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Just a moment mm. of tragic comedy thinking about what they are going to become. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. By the way, on, on the subject of the HIMARS, the Russian MOD has repeated its claim that it's destroyed four. Previously, it had claimed that it had destroyed three. Now they're saying that over the course of July, they destroyed four, which, if true is half the total number that was supplied to Ukraine over the course of July. Now, of course, we can't verify these claims, but the Russian MOD is insisting on them. Stickmark says, oops, meant to give you a tenor. Thanks again, LMPs. Thank you, Stickmarks, for that uh, super chat. Constantine says, they have changed the man, Boris, so they do not change the policy of helping Olensky. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's true. Isn't, isn't that a famous expression that the more things change, the more they remain the same? And, of course, it was the Prince of Lampedusa who once said that, you know, everything must change so that he can remain the same. Boris is a discredited figure, so you shunt him aside, you bring in Liz Truss, and things carry on exactly as they did before. Yep. From L Lilia. Zakharieva, 
In the next elections in Bulgaria, the results would not be very different with somewhat more influence of the extremists. We will enter a permanent cycle of crisis. Who will benefit from this situation? I don't know. But again, um, I, I think you may be right, by the way. But <laughs> if we are going to see a period of prolonged instability in Bulgaria, firstly, that's a tragedy for Bulgaria. But we must always ask who is responsible. Political leaders, both in Brussels and Sofia, who instead of working to consolidate Bulgaria and Bulgarian society, have pursued policies that have taken Bulgaria and the whole of Europe into a dead end. And if we see increasing instability in Bulgaria, that is the result. And it will, the danger is that will be the same pattern right across Europe. From Jincha, uh, head of Hungarian uh, foreign ministry on a visit to Moscow, reports reported by the Russian uh, Federation Embassy. Could this be Hungary cementing ties with Russia pulling away from the EU? I understand that the reason the Hungarians went there was to try to secure more energy supplies in anticipation of the uh, winter. And there's now pictures of the Hungarians in Moscow. They were, there, was a, there was a picture of, uh, I think it was Lavrov, meeting the Hungarians at the foreign ministry guest house, a, a famous Art Nouveau house in Moscow, which the foreign ministry has converted into a guest house. So clearly there's talks and discussions about all of this, but principally I think it's about energy. From uh, Hank, thank you for that super sticker. Zuxuxi says, while the US uh, AAF bases are in the UK, nothing will change. Still part of the system. I agree with that. Remember, those bases are there, obviously in part because the Americans want them there, but principally because the British want them there. Let me repeat again, the single most important part of that triad uh, that Lord Ismay came up with back in the 1940s about NATO. You know, keep the Germans down, the Russians out and the Americans in. The most important part of it from the British point of view is keep the Americans in. Britain is no longer a major power, so it tries to maintain its influence by using the United States, the great power of the United States, and that's why they want those bases to remain in Britain. And it doesn't mean that the US controls Britain, but it does mean that the political system in Britain is joined at the hip with that of the United States. From as Finn said, uh, Agenda 2030 on the way, all hail the Great Reset. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Michael Sherry, thank you for that super chat. Elsa says, gentlemen, are you familiar with the history of Germans in Russia who have been colonists since Catherine I? We are about 10% of Germany's population. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a huge story. And, of course, lots of them, uh, lots of these people came to uh, Germany from Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was a major um, re-emigration or re-immigration back to Germany. They were very, very important in uh, Russian culture and Russian economics. And um, it, by the way, that community actually predates Catherine the Great. They obviously gained more of an impetus under Catherine the Great. It's a massive, massive story. And when, it, when we eventually get round to doing our history series, we will no doubt return to it. Can I just say that at one point, the Germans in uh, Russia uh, in, during the Soviet Union even had their own um, you know, republic within the Russian Federation. Stalin did away with it during the Second World War. Uh, Kenneth says, 
Although a majority of Americans have empathy for the Ukrainian people, a majority is also against the proxy war. I completely agree. I think that's entirely true. Summer of 1970, thank you for that super sticker. Black Tie says, any news of the recent airplane crash in Greece, chaps? <laughs> Lots of news, no information. <laughs> that's the trouble. I mean, I, 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 I haven't been able to make work out what the facts about that story are. I don't know, Alex, whether you have any more information at no, all. No, I'll just say there's a lot of misinformation about it. There's a lot of speculation yeah. that there was yeah. all kinds of crazy stuff on that plane. And yeah. Look, um, I'm here on the ground. I'm reading all the publications. I think it's pretty clear that they were bringing weapons in from, from Serbia to to Ukraine. I, mean, I think that's obvious. I don't think that's that's a big mystery. I'm not saying anything huge or anything, not game-changing weapons, but weapons. Now, the only question that I have is if this plane was slated to land in Greece so it could load up with more weapons, which is what it looks like, or if it dropped over Greece. I don't know. And, and it was just going to, I don't know how, what the flight path was going to be because it doesn't make much sense. But anyway, that's pretty much the only real question that people have. I've, I've heard stories about all kinds of crazy things yeah, on that yeah, plane and all these, a lot yeah. of speculation. But I know. And I, I don't think we should get too no worked up about this. I mean, I, I just don't think there's enough information to. And I think that you know, it's one of these. It's the it's yeah. the sort of thing that goes on in a conflict. All kinds of strange things happen, and you can't always get on top of them. And you perhaps shouldn't yeah. devote too much time uh, on on these kind of details because if you do, you lose focus. Yeah, and and the Russians pretty much knew that that this was happening in Serbia too. This, this isn't like a secret for the Russians either, that there were these, these ammunitions, these, these weapons being brought in via this route. So I don't, it is what it is. That's the only question that people have that I have and a lot of people is, was this going to land or was this on route, in a, on a strange route towards, towards Ukraine? I don't know. Anyway, um, Summer 1970, thank you for that super sticker. Um, neurosurgery says, all of, these, all of this was predicted on Sergei Glaziev's book, The Last World War, the U.S. to move and lose. Yeah. I mean, you know, Glaziev is in his element at the moment. He's all over the place in Russia. <laughs> he's, by the way, just to say, he's one of um, Putin's uh, principal economic advisors. And he's very much one of those who's been pushing for a, a more controlled economy than, um, you know, people in the central bank and the finance ministry have wanted to see up to now. But he's, he's clearly he's clearly making he's clearly making, the, you know, gaining gaining strength at the moment. All right. Russell Doolittle says, uh, look for Turkey to be. Peeled away from NATO, formation of economic corridor for energy food products from Baltic to India, Greece, Turkey, border tensions, EU failed Turkey and NATO controlling Turkey. Thoughts? I, I, you know, this, we have to be so careful about this because when it comes to Turkey or Turkey, I noticed Putin was extremely careful always to refer to the country now as Turkey. But um, let, you know, trying to predict... What they're going to do is never easy. I mean, Erdogan is a volatile character. We don't always know. We don't can't be completely sure how long he's going to be there anyway. And I, I would have thought that there's still a lot of people in Ankara and Istanbul and elsewhere who want to maintain the connection with the West and certainly with NATO. But at the moment, certainly, they seem to be adjusting more towards... Uh, a Eurasian vector. And I think, to many people's surprise, the Ukrainian conflict seems to have intensified that. Hmm. Euro Gabor says, Lavrov just met with his Hungarian counterpart in Moscow. Hungary asks all gas to be transferred via the Turkstream pipeline. Orban creates a law to ease a potential exit. Ursula will blow yeah. a gasket. I, I think this is true, but I'm also going to say something, by the way, which is that the fact that uh, Orban has had to send his foreign minister to Moscow, and apparently there's protests now in Hungary against Orban because of 
Hungary is now experiencing economic problems. I, I, I think it demonstrates that he made a big mistake in agreeing to the, to the oil sanctions a few weeks ago. Um, he, he basically said, you know, provided we get our oil via the pipeline, uh, we're not going to stand in the way of sanctions against, you know, oil being shipped, sent by sea into the EU. And what he now found, what he now finds is that the EU is facing an energy crisis and they're coming after Hungary's energy, which is, you know, partly what all this rationing system is. So I, I, I think it, he should have anticipated that this would happen. And now he's trying, I think, to um, get the Russians on side. I think the Russians may be saying to him, look, you went along with these sanctions. It was your mistake. Why are you looking to us to bail you out now? I mean, so far, you've agreed to every single sanctions package, including this one over oil, which you never said you would, you said you would never agree to. And um, from now on, if you really want our help, you know, we're going to be expecting rather more from you. So I think that, you know, this, this is going to be a rather more difficult discussion between the Hungarians and the Russians than some of the ones that have taken place before. Life of Brian says, what can the British public do in the face of their political classes is transigent contempt for them. The demos seem completely subverted. Well, I think that what they must do is start working towards setting up new parties. Alan Watson, who is um, obviously one of our moderators, but also a stalwart of the Duran community, including on locals, and who is British and lives in Britain as I do, said that the huge political crisis in Britain is coming. He said that on my, on, on my last Locals live stream. And I think he's absolutely right. I've never known the mood in Britain to be so bad. Uh, Zahir, thank you for that super chat. Sanjeva says, if BRICS succeed in creating a reserve currency, then it's pretty much beginning of the end for America's ability to export its inflation. Hopefully, BRICS will achieve this. Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely right. From summer of 1970, resource-based economies are the future. Commodity-based economies will die off. It's inevitable. What well, co commodities are resources. <laughs> never, never, ever forget that. So you can't say a resource-based economy is the future and a commodities-based economy is not because maybe maybe commodities... you meant like a service-based oh i see okay yes yes, yes. maybe I, I don't know i'm just taking a guess yeah here. i i i i i that, think that if, that's if it's service-based then that's true yeah i think that's true yes yeah um ty gutler says is there anyone in the potential uk leadership who would fight against the Jul julian assange extradition this is going to go under the radar now just a few people in in the Labour and Conservative parties in the in Parliament. You could count them on your fingers, and none of them have any importance. Uh, Spark Sparky says uh, now Russia is spreading freedom, not communism. <laughs> Interesting point. Quite a reversal, some would say. Okay. Uh, Claudia Vivarelli says, uh, Alex is right, they will never let Giorgia Meloni, Fratelli d'Italia, happen, including Salvini and Berli. Yeah. I, I, I'm afraid so. I mean, this thing in Italy is going to be a very long and very complex affair. We now have a definite election coming in Italy, and we obviously need to keep a close eye on what's going to happen. But this is far from over. Um, um, the, the forces of the EU establishment in Italy are very, very powerfully entrenched. And consider what happened to the Northern League, its uh, northern industrialists, donors pulled it in and got it to support uh, Draghi. So this is not over. It's not even started. And um, to be frank, Seeing them prevail against these forces is almost beyond what I can 
I can see happen. Right. Through the eyes of, says, with gratitude, watching from the train. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Anya Sticky Marks says, after Thatcher was retired, John Major, about who I used to say, the only person ever to run away from the circus to become an accountant. Art. It's true enough. Very strange uh, life story. <laughs> Very strange lives. We have uh, had no a... really successful prime minister since Thatcher. It's been a political vacuum. Tony Blair, through um, conjuring tricks and mirages and all kinds of things, um, seemed for a time to, you know, to be dominating the political scene. But um, the fact is that when he left, <laughs> everything, we realised that he didn't change anything, he just degraded it. <laughs> so we, we've never had a real f strong political leader focused on Britain since Thatcher left. Hmm. Um, Nina says, off-topic question, has anyone heard any news on Patrick Lancaster? There hasn't been any videos from him for quite some time. I think I did see something, actually, that he actually sent a message that he's fine and that his team is, is fine, so... Um, I, I, th I mean, I'm, that might have been a while back, but I, I, I seem to remember that I saw it quite recently. So I think he's OK. I would have thought that if there was anything right. really wrong with him. We would have heard about it by now. Yeah. Mm. Tim Usman says Iranian drones to Russia is the same category of news as Chinese military assistance. I agree. I don't think it's true. I, I mean, I've said this already. I mean, the Russians... And I think it's possible is that the Russians have been speaking to the Iranians about getting expertise from the Iranians on how to use drones. Iran has used certain types of drones much more intensively than Russia has done because it's had them longer and has used them in combat situations, which the Russians haven't. But I can't really imagine Russia importing drones from Iran. Justin says, hey, look, I'm famous. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Olympia Logic says, what do you think of Erdogan's arm over Putin? It kind of blew up on Twitter with different interpretations from people. I think it was just Erdogan wanting everybody in, Tur in Turkey eh, to see that he and Putin are the best of friends. I think, you know, Turkey's going through some very difficult times at the moment. And I think a lot of people in Turkey, small business people, sometimes bigger business people, are hoping that uh, Russia and the Russian market will be the salvation for them. So I think that's probably what it was all about. Uh, JF, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Texley, thank you for that super chat. Joshua says, did Western Ukraine citizens protest the shelling in the East for the last eight years? Was this not covered in the media or did it not even happen? I think it happened. I never heard about any kind of protests in Western Ukraine about shelling in Eastern Ukraine. <laughs> I doubt there would be, actually. Uh, Utix4321 says, uh, Europe plus Russia is another superpower on par with America and China. Ukraine war makes this impossible now, benefiting the USA slash China. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, a lot of people think that. And I think, that, I think at the beginning of the Ukraine war, I, I thought it too. But I think the one thing that we've seen from the Ukraine war, is that the idea that Russia and Europe and Russia and Germany would ever come together was, uh, was an illusion. It, it's never going to happen. The, the antipathy to Russia on the part of the European political class is just too strong. It's irrational, it's visceral, but they don't seem to be able to get over it. And it, it, it's absolutely blinded them to pretty much everything. I mean, the, the debate, it, it's very weird to read the debate that's going on in Germany at the moment about the sanctions. The fact that Germany is going into an economic crisis is not proof, is not seen by many people in Germany, I'm not saying everybody, but many people in Germany, that it was a mistake imposing the sanctions and antagonising Russia over Ukraine. It's it, it seen instead as proof the Germany should never have developed good relations with Russia in the first place. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the kind of mindset that you're dealing with. 
Uh, Sanjeva says, what's the future of the semiconductor and pharmaceutical industry? Local, locals, communities, members posted some articles from YT about how Russia will never solve semiconductor problems. I think this is just a fantasy, actually. I, 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 I you know, every so often you hear these stories about, you know, the Russians can't do this, they can't do that. There's big programs saying, you know, I, I, there was a program on YouTube that I saw recently called Why Soviet Computers Failed, which is supposed to have some bearing on what goes on in Russia today. I think this is just a just a complete illusion. I think the Chinese, for one thing, can supply Russia with chips if the Russians have shortages with chips. I think that the idea that the Chinese can't and won't is an illusion. And I think that the, the idea that the Russians can't produce semiconductors themselves and chips as well um, is also an illusion, and I, sus I think they're producing them anyway. Um, uh, Bun me tell her, thank you for that super sticker. Reza says, good to see I, Earl Grey on the Duran. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander and Alex at Duran Rocks. Thank you for that, Reza. Uh, RDDR says, excellent work, guys. Where might the Ukrainian situation be in a year from now? I think the war will be over. And I think that the Russians will have achieved all their objectives in Ukraine. The only question is what decisions they will make about how to shape Ukraine. And that I don't really know. But um, um, Douglas McGregor has recently said that he thinks that the Russians are preparing a big knockout blow. And I get exactly the same impression. M. Wick says, illustrative example from the president of the Association of German Chemical Industry, Christian Kuhlmann, this year's winner of the Europe League final in Seville, was the German football club Frankfurt. Okay. <laughs> uh, M. Wick says, the distance between Frankfurt and Seville is roughly 1,800 kilometers by rail. If you have a train of gas wagons on this length, for how long will that maintain the German chemical industry? Eight hours? Okay. Um, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for that, mm -hmm. um, Wick. Uh, uh, Nina says. I mean, I, I, I think I get the point. Actually, ago, it started... I, yeah, I think I get the point, which is that you know you can't import gas in that kind of way. I mean, the, 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 the logistics of moving large amounts of gas from Spain to Germany is just not realistic. That's why you need the pipeline gas coming in from Russia. But note that you know, we're talking in very elliptical terms, German industrialists talking in very elliptical terms, then don't have the courage to simply come out and say this sanctions policy is a disaster and it's destroying Germany. Uh, Nina says, all this insanity started many years ago. It started with the brainwashing and dumbing down the kids through Hollywood, social media and TV. Now we have a government-controlled society created by the U.S. infecting the world. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, 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 I think there's a huge amount of truth in what you say. But when you say the U.S., and I, I really, I do want to say this again. Don't blame everybody in the U.S. There are many, many people in the U.S. who feel the same way as you and who are resisting in the same way as you. Um, Ralph Peterson says, M. Wick reminds that petroleum is the basis for paints, plastics, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, fertilizers, so many, so many industries. Yeah. Thanks for your work. Yeah. Of course. It's true. Th th thank you for that, Ralph. Um, Raul says, a big thank you to all the moderators who keep the sanity out here. Mm. Thank you for that. Uh, Raul, um, summer of 1970 says... Um, any chance of a show on the out-of-control intel agencies in the USA, or is that forbidden? It might be, it might be risky. <laughs> I don't think it's exactly forbidden. Um, it's something we could do. I mean, you know, we, have, we have people who know about the intel agencies, Larry, Larry Johnson, uh, Ray McGovern, people of that kind. It's something we could perhaps look into. Um, perhaps... We might do it also on one of our platforms, exclusively for one of our platforms. It's certainly an idea. Hammer88 says, remember, it was the Chinese that built U.S. rail. But, well, that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. I mean, that was the, uh, the, the Chinese workers coming from China to build the railways. But as I said, that, that was a long time ago now. 
uh, Divine Insurgent says, a lot of critical, fearful Westerners like to say that the relationship between China and Russia have is merely of convenience and nothing more. It's brittle at best to them. What are your thoughts? No, I don't agree. I think that this is wrong. I'm going to say something else. I think, and I've said this many times in many places, in many venues, I think people in the West are far too um, focused on one specific period of Russian-Chinese history, which is the Sino-Soviet split era of the 1960s and early 1970s, which is a period of about 15 years. Now, China and Russia have had relations with each other for 300 years. The, the Russians and the Chinese first established diplomatic contacts in the 1680s, Russia was the first European state to establish diplomatic relations with China, um, apart from the Vatican. And so they've had a very long period of interaction. Sometimes it's been very friendly. Sometimes it's been less friendly. Uh, periods of outright hostility have been very short. And periods of intense friendship have also been relatively short, but they've tended to be longer so I, I, I don't think that this idea that these two countries are hostile and inimical to each other really holds any water at all. I think that this is a misreading of history based on you know, relatively recent events, but events which are very much now in the past and are not going to repeat themselves because the causes of the Soviet, Sino-Soviet split simply don't exist anymore. At this present moment in time, Russian and Chinese interests very closely align. And I think that is enough to bind the two together very closely. And I don't think there's anything brittle about this relationship. And I think it's illusory to think that there is. Henry Curtius, thank you for that super... Chat. Sparky says none of Russia's recent economic contingencies were secret. They were in international news, but were ignored or unnoticed by Western experts. That's so completely true. It's it's the point which you know I, I you know I was making over the course of the program and my rhetorical question to Mike and Alex. I mean, there was all of this about Russia, the size of its economy, the complexity of its economy, the steps Russia was taking to prepare for a sanctions war. It was all done in plain view. So why were people so surprised? From uh, Denitsa Ivanova says, and the West makes us think that we are so advanced that we have to drive electric cars, which in winter we will have to dry them with hats and gloves so that we can go more kilometers. I know that, absolutely. I mean, this is a major issue in Russia. I mean, you know, and I've heard Russians say this, that, you know, it's all very well talking about electric cars in Western Europe and California, but, you know, in, a, in the cold winters in Russia, electric cars aren't going to get you very far. <laughs> From uh, Zach Ken, pushing... Uh, the passports at airports, Australia building four massive camps, Western economic collapse, pricing citizens into desperation while leaders pretend ineptitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will. Th thank, thank you for you that, answer. Zach. Jo Joanna, thank you for that super sticker. Paul, uh, thank you for that super chat. Nina, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky, uh, smugnerant fools run the West. Thank you for that. Jacob Visser says, as a U.S. citizen, what would you recommend to do? Is it time to leave the U.S. and move to a non-NATO Eastern European country? What should we do? I did. Well, first of all, there are not many non-NATO European countries, East European countries left. So don't expect that. I, I never give people advice about that. Everybody must make their own decisions. I still think personally, for what it's worth, that the U.S. has an awful lot to offer. And it's a huge country. And perhaps you might want to consider, if you're unhappy where you are, there's lots of other places in the U.S. where you could move, presumably, and they might, you know, suit you better. So I'm not going to give you that that kind of advice. I don't think it's for us to do it. What I would say is clearly lots of things are going wrong in the U.S. But I also have to say this. I think the chances of the U.S. turning things round are much higher 
than in Europe. So don't expect that you will find greener pastures and a safer footing in Europe than you would find in the US itself. Um, El Loco, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Martin Bosch says, please make a podcast with the redacted. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin, for that. Uh, Gwendolyn, thank you for the super sticker. J. James Edwards, thank you for that super sticker. Russell Doolittle says, guess where Zelensky's family is in the USA? Mm -hmm. There is more to the story of Banankov and PGO and more than 90 security officials removed unconstitutional actions. Yermak Aristovich faction won for now. I think this is probably true. Uh, I would agree, by the way, that we don't know the full story here. Um, Justin says, can I be famous again? Thank you, Justin, for that. Um, thank you, Lana Zenkova, for that super sticker. Thank you, Randolph, for the super chat. Dean says the financial system is based solely on debt only, and the EU is a type of Ponzi scheme. The EU must expand to keep the scheme going mm. until we get World War yeah. III. I think you've summed it up very well. Only I only hope we don't yeah. get World War III. Uh, Sparky says smugnerance is bliss in the mm. West. Thank you, Sparky, for that. Zook Zooksy says thank you, gents. Thank you, Zook Zooksy, for that. T-Tom says, the World War I and this war is about controlling the roots. UK and US control sea roots. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think that if you're talking about China, I mean, they're looking to create their own alternative routes, including land routes, but also sea routes to the north in order to secure their access to essential energy and raw materials. And I think a lot of this whole struggle is about this now. Um, Reza says, informative and factual discussion. Thank yeah. you, gentlemen. Thank you, Reza, for that. Sanjeva says, example of how flawed GDP nominal is regarding Russia. The, comp the company CAT had the most productive factory in Russia, but the workers were paid orders of magnitude less than in Europe. I've heard this many times. In fact, I, 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 when I was more uh, closer to these things, I used to hear all kinds of stories from uh, about how impressed Western companies were with the productivity of their Russian factories and how disciplined and skilled Russian workers are and, you know, how cheap they were. <laughs> but, of course, that never really gained critical mass um, in terms of the trade with the West because, of course, all of the restrictions that were always imposed there. But, no, I agree with that. I think that's a very good point that you've just made. Sparky says the West will be the source of mail order brides. Thank you, Sparky, for that. Reza says, thank you, Mods. Thank you, Reza, for that. Thank you, Mods. Uh, Kickjack says, will you all do a show with lawyers on how people can move to a place like Russia, permanent residency? Well, I think we'd have to think about this. As I said, I don't want to get into a situation where we are appear to be encouraging people um, um, and uh, to be honest, I, you know, we're a geopolitical site more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, La Republic says in the Telegram comments on Duran videos, there is a section of people trying to convince viewers to stop focusing on world leaders and only focus on the true people in power. Uh, powerful Jews, Klaus Schwab, George Soros, the Rothschild family, Kazarians, etc. What is your response to this? Well, I think we tried to cover um, all bases. Re report them. If there's a reporting feature on Telegram, if there's a reporting feature on Telegram, like a flagging feature, then, then flag it. And uh, I'll, uh, We're working on getting Telegram uh, more optimized, better, better sense. It's, it's still a work in progress. Um, let's see... Uh, J J H N S says the Russian government can't expect to find fertile ground for diplomacy when dealing with F R G puppets working in service of the occupiers. Germany is still in foreign hands. Russia's troops left. The U S has fifty plus bases. U K shipped new tanks. Twenty twenty. Yeah, can I just say something? I, I I take all those points, and I think that there's a lot of truth to them, but. Look at the language and the tone of European politicians. When it came to this crisis, they didn't need encouragement from the US to say and be 
and do all the things they did. So don't underestimate. I mean, I, I did underestimate the visceral feelings they have towards Russia. They don't need encouragement from the United States to be that way. All right. And Elena says, being in Canada's East Coast, I could catch only the end of the stream. I will be listening and recording. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena, for that. And that is... That is everything. Thank you, everybody, Absolutely. for the questions. Take care.